we have a good morning set up um, and we'll have a panel where we talk about ways to do business with the Navy with textiles and clothing. And then we'll have a Q&A period and we will have a special guest of retired Rear Admiral Robert J. J. Bianchi, the CEO of Nextcom, who will speak later in the day. So thank you all for joining us. And Laura, I will turn it over to you uh, to welcome everybody back. So thank you everyone, as always with these virtual events to go through the technical challenges. So appreciate everyone coming back and um, we will start. I just wanted to cut, you know, give a synopsis of yesterday's um, discussions for those that were able to join us. Thank you. Um, a lot of, there was a lot of discussions, you know, in very short, um, increments. So hopefully today that has stimulated some questions that may have arise the oh by the ways that can be covered later on um, this morning. Um, uh, again with the, the panel that's going to be coming forward soon is um, that will also hopefully stimulate some questions as well. So some of the areas that you know NCTRF discussed and identified for um, capability gaps we talked about uh, environmentally friendly areas, sustainable practices that industry is, is currently um, looking at. Um, we're definitely, there's definitely a viable and areas of interest for the group. And then looking at testing and evaluation, better means and methods for knowledge management of, of data that we um, develop and utilize and um, partnering in areas specific to the biophysical, better understanding the uniqueness and testing um, uh, gender specific um, when you're looking at the in, um, assessment of a system as gender specific for thermal management. Um, also, innovative fabrication methods. That's a real um, interest area. A lot of the challenges we've identified lately is the loss and skill set in that specialized um, focus area of garments that are made for suiting in a more formal wear. Um, it's not just as simple as doing a straight stitch. It's really um, a capability that's developed over time and it seems to be diminishing within the United States. Um, in sizing practices, a little better understanding of industry or developing better practices in regards to sizing and the use of sizing in um, means and methods with which, with which we can streamline development of uniforms. Um, and then we're also, there are a multitude of other areas that we had briefed um, that will be available with the slides and um, the recordings that will be accessible later after the event. Um, I do, and then also you can't forget the North Carolina Military Business Center and the 401 Tech Bridge who provided a great overview of their support and their efforts and mission that really helped to transition for these small businesses and in, in industry into the federal defense and you know, partnering, collaborating, collaborating to really help and aid um, the Department of Defense and our mission set. And um, then of course we covered overviews of NABSUP, NCTRF, NEXCOM, and just giving that holistic understanding of how all um, the organizations work together to really bring you know, the requirements forward for to meet um, the Navy objective of streamlining capabilities and readiness for the warfighter. Um, so one area that did come up too as well is that recruitment challenge space for in the industry of clothing and textiles is really getting that skill set that seems to be diminishing. Um, I think I was in a forum with, I think it was a FedTech forum where an individual was briefing and I apologize, I don't remember his name, but he's you know, it's, you're really looking to bring textiles and bring textiles, the coolness back to the textile field. So I, I think that really is um, a fact, not necessarily coolness, but the factor of the interest area and the knowledge base of, you know, what the science and the technology that's behind textiles. And I, I don't think people like I had talked yesterday and a few of us had in regards to you don't learn this in school. So that's a real interest area for, I think, all of um, both NCTRF, NEXCON, and such as individuals having that understanding. Um, so again, uh, thank you everybody for returning and we look forward to the discussions 
uh, this afternoon and um, the one-on-ones that we will have later. Um, greatly appreciate the panel members participate participation, Rich Hanabal and Chris Espenshade. And again, Mr. Bianchi, keynote speaker. Um, it's always a pleasure and I look forward to hearing from him as well. So thank you, Mary. Uh, we can proceed. So for our, our panel discussion on demystifying doing business with the clothing and textiles for NAVSUP, NCTRF, and Nexcom, we have Chris Espenshade, who currently serves as the Director of the Office of Small Business Programs at the Naval Supply Systems Command. He is headquartered in Mechanicsburg, Pennsylvania. NAVSUP's mission is to provide supplies, services, and quality of life support to the Navy and Joint Warfighter. War and NAVSUP manages supply chains that provide material for Navy aircraft, surface ships, submarines, and their associated weapon systems. Prior to leading NAVSUP's Office of Small Business Programs, Mr. Espenshade spent 12 years as a contracting specialist, officer, and procurement analyst with the NAVSUP Enterprise, supporting a number of NAVSUP procurement initiatives and reform efforts. We also have with us Laura Winters, who is the director of the Navy Clothing and Textile Research Facility. In her role as director, she has oversight of the NCTRF mission to maximize the quality of life for Navy sailors throughout, through uniform and protective clothing development and sustainment. Laura is located in Natick, Massachusetts and executes this mission in Natick and Philadelphia alongside a team of 30 highly skilled professionals. We uh, are, Third panelist is Rich Hannibal, the Executive Vice President, Chief Merchandising and Marketing Officer for Navy Exchange Service Command, NEXCOM. Mr. Hannibal is the Executive Vice President. Uh, he is responsible for $2.7 billion in retail buying, advertising, supply chain management, and marketing. And he has more than 25 years of industry experience in areas including creative marketing, consumer loyalty, engagement, product, and brand development. Welcome to all of you today. Um, the panelists are each going to talk briefly about this topic, and then I have some questions for them that were uh, submitted yesterday through the chat and uh, through through email to us. So, well, welcome. Thank you. Um, I know you know we have uh, a lot of engagement with industry. NCTRF does, and I, I think this forum is established for questions that can be applicable to understanding how we work with industry. So NCTRF is a support element to NEXTCOM and NAVSUP. So I do have a budget, which is direct funding, which is operations and maintenance. And the, the, that funding element is really to help in, in aid in the improvement of the mission area, which is uniforms and general purpose organizational clothing for the Navy. So when we execute these um, improvements, when we're, we're going out to industry a lot, everything that we do is based off of requirements. These requirements come from the fleet, they can come from um, the CNO, they come, it comes from our customer base. We also have an element with which we provide the support and the expertise to other DOD entities, as well as Homeland Defense entities, where we help to facilitate their um, uniform clothing and textile area. So on how we execute that is they fund us based on our reimbursable funding um, and we are uh, provide the level of support that's needed. So some in a lot of cases, I will say for a business entity, our, our funding streams or any inquiries into anything that's applicable for our development will come through um, betasam.gov and it will come through in, in a request for information, or if it's applicable, it'll come through a contract action, which will be executed um, by NAPSA. So um, I really, if, if individuals don't have access to um, the beta SAM, I highly recommend accessing that um, platform and setting it up. They can get reminders, you can get information. Um, also some of the areas that we've run into issues new entities that are looking to get into the government that don't have cage codes. We, that is a must. So we've engaged one specific area that comes to mind is we've been working in 3D um, software. Um, we were working with other customers that we had interests. 
but they were unable to attain a cage code. So that's some of the uniqueness that's a requirement that we need in order for the contract action to occur. Um, our funding support and such through the R&D will come through the NAVSTUF office. So when Chris gets back on, he'll highlight that. And then of course, in the support element, we support Nexcom's mission as well, which I will now segue into Rich Honnabal. Well, and I'll go the reverse. We're here to support the uh, NCTRF and, and the uniform mission. So um, uh, my background is outside industry, but it is a small world. Uh, actually, back in 2004, um, I was with Brooks Brothers and had the opportunity to work with NCTRF and uh, uh, Navy Exchange Service Command to help develop the Premier Uniform Collection, uh, which is one of the highlights of my career there. And then several years later, almost two decades later, well, no, I guess I'm not doing math, Laura, probably 16 years later, found my way back uh, here to the Navy Exchange Service Command. My role is as chief merchandising officer for the retail part, which is Navy Exchange. And then from the uh, chief marketing perspective, uh, I oversee all of our brand marketing and all of our enterprise level marketing. Um, but as Laura and I have talked about on the side, we, we're here to support each other. Um, and we're here to leverage the best learnings that we have from a um, from a technical side, from a government procurement side, from a uniform development side, but also from a, an outside industry perspective. Um, we can take learnings that we have from retail side, partnerships that we have from the retail side, and look to leverage those and vice versa as well. Probably one of the prouder accomplishments that I think Laura and I both have, um, unfortunately in challenging circumstances, um, but it, it reminds us why we're here and why we do love what we do was the, was the development um, of face masks early in the, in the pandemic. Um, when the Navy decided, and I believe the date was March 24th, that uh, face coverings was a, a, a must, um, we, uh, we worked together. Um, on the retail side, we leveraged the partnerships that we have from a domestic capability perspective, existing relationships, and then also other ones that, that we had um, from a pure retail perspective, and then worked very closely with Laura and her team to make sure that we were specking it correctly, testing it, making sure that we didn't send anything that uh, wasn't, wasn't appropriate. And I think, Laura, if I'm not mistaken, we were able to acquire and distribute the first face masks to the Theodore Roosevelt and the U.S. Navy Honor Guard within less than four weeks. You are correct. Thank you. Um, now, I believe Laura's team was actually uh, instrumental in going and picking up samples and, and uh, doing a lot of the testing at, at home when they didn't have access to the labs. So um, it's, a, it's a very unique partnership. Um, it's a collaborative partnership. And so to be a, a part of this and, and support Laura, depending on what the antimicrobial treatment is, um, it, it may be commercially acceptable, or um, but if it, if it degrades quickly, then it's not something that uh, would work for us. Laura's far more of an expert than I am, but I can, what I would do, what I would say in support of it is, is that from an outside perspective, and not Nexcom, but I'm talking outside industry, when you look at antimicrobial, it's can you market it and, you know, what, what are, what are the care instructions and, and does it really work? Um, here with NCTRF and, and, and Nexcom, it, it really has to add value. It has to be effective. It has to test and it has to stand up to the rigors of what, of how our sailors are actually taking care of their clothing. So it, um, it has to mean something. And I've watched that in action. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. Uniforms and things that get really hard wear. So Chris is back. Um, can we, <laughs> you, oh, we can hear you. Excellent. Right. So uh, let's loop back and Chris will bring your slides up and you can talk for a few minutes and then we'll go back into the Q&A. Okay. Yeah, and I, I apologize. Virtual events are always fun. Uh, things that worked yesterday don't work today. So I apologize for... Uh, for hitting a little bit of a snag here. But what I thought was um, might be beneficial for the folks that are on the line, uh, those that are small businesses that have not typically uh, engaged with NAVSUP or have engaged with DOD in general, uh, I thought I'd give a, a little bit of a quick overview of, of Naval Supply Systems Commands, our, our unique contracting authority, um, what from a command standpoint, what our ownership is out there for Navy 
Uh, and then I go through some some quick tips on engaging. Hey, I have a product. How do I uh, get in front of some uh, some program managers or customers uh, to show off my product and show its capability? So, uh, first slide you see here is really just a geographical look at what makes up the Naval Supply Systems Command, um, specifically our, our contracting authority. So, as you can see, we're a worldwide command. Uh, that oversees the execution of uh, a contracting mission uh, that is both uh, non-appropriated, which uh, you know would be our, our next com partners, and then appropriated, which would be supporting the fleet, uh, Navy supply. You know, specifically, a, a lot of our relevancy is at our fleet logistics centers, and then here in Mechanicsburg and in, in, in Philadelphia, which is uh, NAVSUP weapon system supply, which is. We are uh, essentially the auto zone uh, for the fleet when they need to come in and purchase an item uh, to continue to go underway or modernization um, weapon system supplies what we do. So again, I won't go too deep into each uh, fleet logistics center. Um, they have a unique mission dependent on the fleet that they support. Of course, we have both pack fleet, uh, Atlantic fleet, uh, and then support Oconus uh, ship repair throughout the world. So what I would highlight here is that uh, Naval Supply Systems Command, um, from, a, from a dollar standpoint, we're about third or fourth across the Navy executing about $8 billion worth of, of contracting authority. But um, what makes us unique is that we execute over 40% of the Navy's contracting actions uh, because we delegate contracting authority out to over 600 commands throughout the Navy field contracting system. Uh, from a small business standpoint, I have 24 uh, individuals who support small business advocacy at our major buying commands uh, within the NAVSUP command structure. And those are executed within SECNAV uh, 4380 that, that outline specifically the types of things that the small business community is involved with, uh, you know, acquisition planning, advocacy, uh, when we get to the point of uh, solicitation, those sorts of things. So um, real quick, next slide. Okay, so again, this is a, an overview of what NAVSUP is responsible for as far as authority. So I already, I already spoke about NAVSUP weapon system supply, and that's really, you know, uh, supply support, program office support for NAVC, NAVAIR, uh, the transportation, distribution, uh, material handling uh, for Navy supply, as well as our fleet logistics center, quality of life type of, um, of support. So you have hazmat warehousing, again, postal, food provisioning. Um, Really today though, you know, the, the benefit of this program is to talk about NEXTCOM and, and the unique mission is of supporting uh, uniform uh, design, sustainment, uh, the ship store, Navy exchanges, uh, Navy Lodge, and, and then specifically Navy clothing textile research facility that does a lot of great work with uh, continue to refine down Navy uniform. And I also look at, hey, how do we support COVID-19 uh, with, uh, you know, a lot of amazing work that they did with through the, the CIBR program and looking at, um, you know, the, the 3D masking and uh, other, other supportive efforts. Next slide. So again, um, just some real helpful tips uh, with, with getting some traction and reaching out to a command that you're interested in supporting, whether it's, it's NEXTCOM um, or it's any other DOD component command. You know, most importantly is um, you're not going to get too much traction if you haven't already done the upfront research. So all of uh, federal wide procurement is available on SAM.gov. You can uh, slice dice that information any way you see fit, whether it's by NAICS code, PSC, FSC, um, all that good information is available. Now, it is only a 90 day delay, which isn't a huge problem. Uh, but just something to keep aware of. So you're, you're seeing about a 90, 90 day delay in procurement data. But I think this, um, this data is important when you look at strategically approaching which command. It'll help you kind of uh, get that in mind as far as, hey, this, these are the commands that um, either buy the items that I, I want to sell to the Navy or DOD, or these are the ones that are responsible for oversight on it. Um, and then once you have that identified, map your capability statement in an effort to say, look, you know, not so much, hey, I'm a woman owner or I'm a hub zone um, company that's looking to support, 
you know, those are all important attributes, but I think it's most important to frame it as, hey, I can do this for you faster, cheaper, and in a better way than what you're currently doing. Those, that's what sells uh, to the end user because specifically in DOD, at the end of the day, we have a, a mission to support sailors, uh, Marines uh, with better capability uh, so that they can be more effective in their role. Um, the other thing is, is um, you know, don't oversell your capabilities. I see a lot of small businesses that um, they, they kind of drown in opportunity. So they get a really big contract. Uh, it's really exciting. And then they can't deliver. And um, once you affect your past performance rating, it's, it's basically you're, you're done um, supporting DOD. So be very mindful of that. Um, and then the last point really on this slide is, uh, Man, take advantage of the procurement technical assistance centers. Those are if you're if you're just starting and you're not sure, um, you know where to start in terms of uh, outreach to commands. PTAX will help you with uh, kind of marketing yourself to the various DoD agencies, as well as they'll help you write proposals. They'll review your proposals before uh, submitting them, and this is normally a free uh, you know a free service and at most 50 to hundred dollars to just re, uh, recoup some of those uh, costs associated, but it, it's a tremendous uh, value for a little investment on behalf of uh, a small business. Uh, next slide. Here's some, some helpful tools. Again, SBA, if you're looking to get involved with uh, defense contracting, I really recommend you look at um, breaking in as a subcontractor, getting your feet wet through that instead of jumping right into prime work. Uh, a lot of uh, traditional defense contractors are looking to do either joint ventures or partner with somebody and they utilize um, a subnet. So it's uh, again, the, the website's up there, but this is essentially like a, a virtual meeting place for uh, defense contractors looking to find additional subcontracting capability. So I really recommend uh, that you utilize that to try to make some connections. Um, and again, uh, I spoke about it a little bit earlier, but uh, find your niche within uh, DOD. Um, and if you're awarded a contract, uh, keep that constant communication with, with the core on your contract as well as the contracting officer, um, because it's, uh, I, you know, the adage is, you know, bad news uh, doesn't get better with time. So it's best that you continue that communication so that you can work through it, uh, get some comfort level from the customer that you're supporting uh, and maintain a, a good past performance uh, within that customer satisfaction. Next slide. So uh, in, in terms of if you're looking to support uh, NAVSUP, Nextcom as well, uh, what we've done is we've kind of over, overhauled our small business page to develop a, a NAVSUP interested vendor form. This is essentially capturing uh, your capability statements into a database that all of our contracting officers have access to uh, when they're in the market research efforts. Uh, so we have that all captured. Uh, instead of you, know, you guys sending out capability statements that potentially get lost or, or overlooked, we now have it captured into uh, a database that allows for uh, contracting officers to, to search through and see who has expressed interest in past performance past procurements and then as well as uh you know tying that to our long-range acquisition forecasts of upcoming anticipated requirements so uh, it's really vital that you submit that if you do have interest in supporting NAVSUP um, and additionally there's a lot of good information about what NAVSUP buys you know where we're at and what our mission is so I uh, employ you to to take a look at our website and then the last slide again is just uh, if you have any questions related to NAVSUP contracting uh, where you can get involved and in, in trying to uh, maybe connect with some other folks within the NAFSOP enterprise, feel free to reach out. And that's what I have on uh, behalf of NAFSOP contracting a small business. Thanks. Thanks, Chris. It was a very helpful overview. Um, so bringing back that just came in, is does the Navy have a list of prime contractors that they provide to the small business community? Yeah, so we, we don't provide a listing of prime contractors. I think um, the easiest way to really find that information is, is we, uh, again, I, I update uh, every six months our procurement data specific just to NAVSUP. Now you can see um, Navy-wide by going to Department of Navy Office of Small Business Programs, they have what does the Navy buy. 
and then it'll have procurement data, um, you know, the awardees information on there. So if you wanted to do uh, reach out to them, you know, one on one to say, hey, you know, I know you do this work on behalf of the Navy, and I'd like to support you as a subcontractor. That's also another opportunity. Um, and then um, if you want to see a cross federal procurement uh, and not just not, not just Navy, but if you want to see any of the other services procurement data, you can pull that directly off of SAM.gov. Great, thank you. Um, I would say uh, on one of your slides, you called out the PTAX, uh, which provide an excellent service to help companies navigate a lot of this um, and, and work through the questions and have a great understanding of the applications. Um, another resource to reach out to is Naval X has started the TechBridge program. There are 16 or 17 TechBridges uh, in the US and London now, um, and they also are uh, help working with the, there that's a Navy organization that is helping to uh, draw in more small businesses to help specifically with R and D. Um, and if you would, you can email me if you'd like to be connected into the um, the the Navy Tech Bridges. Uh, we're 401 Tech Bridge. We're not. We are an independent nonprofit, not part of the Navy Tech Bridge, uh, but we do support the Navy's Tech Bridge in the Northeast Tech Bridge here. Um, and we do a lot of work of trying to understand companies, technology, and their R and D capacity, um, and then finding the resources within the Navy. Uh, that they might best match with. So there are uh, federal and nonprofit organizations that are helping to support and can uh, help work through you. I think a lot of small businesses don't realize that, um, that a lot of these resources exist and they really want to help you um, and that you shouldn't hesitate to reach out to them in order to uh, let them help you make connections into, uh, into these opportunities. Um, so for the next question, we have, um, let me see, if there's a new uniform coming out, how will the industry be made aware of the opportunity for, uh, so that they can get in at the beginning of the process as new uniforms are being developed? That would be me. Um, so new uniforms is multiple forums that we utilize in regards to communication again I, when i discussed the sam um beta.gov that's a lot it's a portal that we definitely use in in the manner we use it is um we go out with rfi so requests for information from industry um some things that i've seen that have been challenging for us is we go out on an rfi and when i briefed yesterday some of the schedule that we um have for programs you know they extend over fiscal years so it's not we'll look at something and then it may not meet requirements um it really does benefit industry to maintain awareness of what that original request and if there is a period of time in which they're do, doing development as well either even if it they can't meet our request as documented, but they might have a capability in the years out, or there's a means or method that they might need assistance to further refine that capability. It really does benefit for them to come in and say, hey, oh, by the way, you know, we don't currently have a product, but we are looking at this and this, and we're looking at it from a certain um, understanding. So having aware, like our information goes out there, based on RFIs. And then as we get further down the road, um, you'll start seeing it presented in different joint forums, um, like DLA forums, JPBI, um, which I think they're hosting in the November timeframe. And that's an industry-wide where DLA, it goes out and provides information in regards to what all the services are working on and planning and procurement and such. So, um, and then there's other forums too that we um, go out to like the Tech Bridge, North Carolina Business Center and such that have information in regards to what other services are trying to attain or the Navy is trying to attain for different uniforms. Over. Yeah, the, uh, so I'd, I would just add also, if, if you're interested, if you think you have a, um, either a service or a product that can support whether it's NCT ERF or it's NAVSUP or any other DOD in general, you know, writing a white paper and submitting it either via through, you know, CIBR, um, broad agency announcements, even if for some reason it's not selected uh, for that specific topic, 
I think it's always good to kind of make people think, well, you know, this doesn't work necessarily for this project, but I definitely have a need for a similar type of item. Um, and, and then that just keeps the dialogue going. Great, thank you. Um, I neglected to mention the North Carolina uh, Military Business Center as a resource and as a co-host that uh, of this event, neglectful of me, um, but they do offer terrific uh, resources to companies that are interested in working with the military and they are not just limited to companies that are based in North Carolina. They do a lot of partnering. So no matter where you are, you can reach out to Scott Dorney and he put his information in the chat um, and his team to uh, help connect you into uh, opportunities and support um, if, you're, if you are interested in working with the military. Um, our next question that came in through the chat is, is there a requirement that boot socks be flame resistant or must they be flame resistant, no melt, no drip and safe to fly? So the requirement aboard a ship is FR the offshore is is not the accessories um i would probably have to wait to answer that question just because i'm not quite sure on the accessories but aboard a ship the requirement is fr at, at a minimum there should be no melt no drip so not using synthetics and such but um in the safe to fly aspect that fall would fall under nav air so we would have to inquire with nav air on that requirement over okay. um let me see can vendor can a vendor become a supplier to nextcom for the retail side as well as for uniforms yes there's no restriction in fact we have several suppliers that cross over um that uh that manufacture for the manufacture uniforms but are also suppliers for us either in our private brand or in um or supply one of the brands that they that they manufacture so um absolutely one can cross over okay and i know that you had talked about a gap uh yesterday with sewers um where there just isn't a lot of that talent left uh, here anymore, or there's a, a dwindling amount of talent there. What other gaps do you see in terms of both your R&D needs and, and your procurement needs? Where do you start? <laughs> I, Chris, Laura, I'm going to defer to you because I'm dealing with a retail supply chain that is unlike anything I've ever seen. So you're probably going to be able to answer it more from your perspective. It, 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 yeah. It, in, I think we could go, I can think that again, that could be a whole nother panel. I mean, COVID has wreaked a level of havoc that it, 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 I think it's unprecedented right now in the industry. Um, I think there, you know, years ago, I, when I first graduated college, it, um, and I'm not gonna tell you when, um, <laughs> it was, I, I mean, textiles was, know concerning and now just over the years the the manufacturing base in the united states is really it's at it, it, it is is it is it's significant and and i think you know we have in multiple areas we have one supplier base and in multiple key components to our um our, to the navy uniform and also you know that's why we're always looking to see like areas that we can maybe novel manufacturing innovative approaches that you know the cyber program where we you know like chris was saying put a white paper out there if you see it, you never know what's going to stick and and things change over time like you know plm product life cycle management systems we've been looking at it we've been admiring it we don't have anything um that is set within the services for that product life cycle management we're going back to it again so and a lot of times the like 3D, um, looking at it from software and doing patterning and such, like it wasn't there, the market wasn't there before, but it's quickly evolving just because of COVID and the lack of hands-on. We do a lot of fit assessments and it requires us to put our hands on individual sailors and trying to draw down on that development cycle is imperative. Um, I will say, 
we struggled just as much and I mean, Rich can, and the retail side can, can also provide a lot of insight. I mean, that's why we're here for these forums. It's really to put, we wanna get that information out there, get industry stimulated and start to really help us to look at these capability gaps that we are currently can see down the horizon being that big of a problem. We like to be proactive instead of reactive. And unfortunately, in some cases right now, you know, where it's really difficult, we are being reactive and it puts us in a really challenging um, spot where we have uniforms that, you know, a recruit goes to basic, you know, and they may not be able to get that item. And, and that's unacceptable. So um, we're, we really do rely on the tech bridge and rely on industry and, and want to, you know, take these gaps that we are identifying now and work to start to have that development cycle and get through it and get it out to the fleet in a, in a period of time so that we don't have these problems and we're proactive versus reactive. Over. Yeah, I'll, um, I'll lean in. I'll lean into that quickly from a retail perspective because I think it emulates um, uniforms. Um, it's extraordinarily challenging, and I think innovation today, when you're looking at between transportation, where it's being sourced, raw materials, packaging costs, um, fuel costs, uh, consolidation of lines, labor increases, and 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 it goes on and on and on. It's extraordinarily tumultuous. We don't know from one day to the next if what we've ordered is actually going to come in. And this is from the most reputable brands and manufacturers. Um, I, you know, we're looking at it is to a certain extent, I won't say chaos, but it is, you know, it, it is borderline chaos um, with what's going on with a ship. I think that provides a, a great opportunity. I think there's more of an open to listen today. And I think innovation isn't just whether it's antimicrobial or what you're doing to, to a, um, from a tech perspective, which is, is, is of critical importance as well. But do you have a different way of manufacturing? Have you been able to do something more efficiently? Can you reduce the time that it takes in order to get something um, to, the, to the shelf, whether it's a retail product or a uniform product? Um, we have a tremendous open to listen right now because of the fact that a lot of what we know has been thrown up in the air and we're reinventing it as we go. So tough time, but a good time to lean forward. Yeah, we work a lot with the Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program uh, throughout the network throughout the country and are hearing that from everyone. The supply chain is just unprecedented right now and is everyone is behind and struggling and trying to get the materials they need to produce. Um, and it, I imagine it's much more impactful on your side when you're actually trying to make sure that you have equipment and gear to the warfighter in time. Um, so uh, it's, it, it's a struggle. Uh, we are at the end, of, I'm sorry, we're at the end of this segment, but if you guys want to continue, we're going to pull in the uh, technical experts who spoke yesterday to continue Q&A. Um, and the questions have been a mix of general and uh, specific. So uh, if you can stay for the next 15 or 20 minutes, um, and we will ask the technical experts from yesterday to unmute and put their cameras on, and then we'll, we'll bring you all up for the, um, for the second segment of the Q&A. But if you guys would like to have some summary now while we do that, please do, that, do so. Chris, you can start. Okay. Yeah, I, you know, I thought the last question was a really good question as to the reality of where we're at. I know, you know Richard said not chaos. I would almost say it's managed chaos at this point from a, from the Navy lead of supply and logistics is that um, turning a negative into a positive is, uh, you know, pandemic is what we're calling really a great illuminator as to supply chain risks and shifting from reactive to proactive risk assessment. That's the, that's a real big um, area that we're starting to focus in is like, how do we put the, the uh, infrastructure in place to proactively manage uh, not only first tier, but second, third, fourth tier uh, risk, you know, whether that's foreign investment, whether that's just manufacturing um, sources drying up from uh, sequestration, consolidation, those sorts of things. So. Um, I think it's a it's an interesting time if you have manufacturing capability, um, U.S. based, you're you're in a good position and you need to make yourself um, be more vocal and and have DoD aware of your capabilities. So 
um, I hope everyone thought that this was a great opportunity to learn a little bit about uh, NCTRF, NAVSUP, uh, and again, thank you for being a part of the panel. Thank you, Chris. Um, Hi, Rich. Rich, do you have final words? No, I appreciate the opportunity to be part of this. Um, yeah, it is controlled chaos, um, and and there's if if I ever look at the last sixteen months and and look at silver linings and blessings in disguise, there really isn't one. Um, but I do think I, I like that the the the, uh, the grand illuminator. We're learning a lot from it. It's laying bare some of the. Uh, maybe inefficiencies and things that that we've been harboring in the past, and it's forcing us to look at how we can innovate, which is the right time for a partner to come forward and, and you know, either on the retail side or the uniform side and help us figure that out. And so I think forums like this are good. I, I won't be able to stay for the, the next segment because I'm actually the noise behind me is William and Mary, and I'm doing the college tours with uh, with my daughter. So um, as an alum, they let me tap that. into the Wi-Fi. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you for joining us, and, and good luck with thank the college you, tours. One of the benefits of having virtual is the uh, the fact that we can do this uh, more readily. But I appreciate the uh, opportunity. Terrific. Thank you very much. And Laura, appreciate it. Thanks, Rich and Chris. I think this again, this panel was great. I think the intent was definitely delivered and providing uh, information, further information in regards to business opportunities and in, in, in working with both NAVSUP and NEXTCOM and NCTRF. I think the information, I hope the individuals walk away with um, just even a little bit of information. We're not gonna be able to cover it all, but at least a POC where you can go to, because like we've all been saying, it is a level of controlled chaos, but um, the situation we're in right now really does help highlight some areas of vulnerability that we want to hone in on and, and improve upon and, and be assured that you know we maintain that readiness and capability for the Navy. So um, thank you and thank you everyone on the panel as well. It was, it was very informative, appreciate it. Over. Yes, uh, Laura, Chris and Rich, thank you all very much. And thank you for all the great questions that have come through the chat and came through uh, via email. Uh, we, I see a few extra people joining us, which is great. So if the, the other uh, technical experts who were presenters yesterday could join us, and then we have some additional questions. And Rich, enjoy your tours, and thanks so much for joining us. Lynn and Chris and Louise, thank, thank you so you. much. All right. Let's see. And some of these questions, Chris, if you can hang on, do probably reference back to you. Oh, and yeah, Amy, yeah, thank no you. Uh, so let's see. Is there a resource for knowing what materials are unacceptable, such as the acrylic mentioned? Yeah, I would probably, I, Laura, if you're still on, that's probably uh, more specific to, to you guys as to whether or not you can release information out there that, that says, hey, this is what we can't support from a Navy uniform. Um, yeah, there's information. I think if, if it's the purpose for a general purpose organizational clothing, um, Amy can answer the, that question in regards to the use of boardership. And also Amy can answer that I didn't fully answer the question in regards to um, socks and the requirement for, or, or can add upon it if I didn't fully provide a clear answer in regards to that. Um, there is information out there if we're going, because there's different areas that you look at, safe to fly versus shipboard and such. So um, I don't think, we don't have a compiled list of what's a no-no per se. It just needs to meet certain FR requirements that we test against. Anything to add, Amy? Are you talking specifically about socks right now? So the one question earlier was about socks. And then this question in particular is, are there fibers that aren't allowed, i.e. acrylic and such, aboard a ship? Over. Um, none that aren't, are not allowed, you know, specifically. Um, typically, fibers are part of blends. Um, that have to meet certain FR requirements, which I think is the answer that you gave. Um, so, 
you know, the only issue is the berry compliancy. So I know there are some fibers out there. Um, for example, there's one, I believe it's called Kermel. It's, it's an FR fiber used by the Canadian Navy. Um, it's not domestically manufactured. So we, it's not one that we can use on um, our ships. We haven't done any testing or approval on that fiber. Um, so typically if it's very compliant and the blend itself meets up our requirements, then, um, then it would be allowed on a ship. Um, for the socks, the answer you provided earlier is um, correct. Um, we don't actually have an FR requirement for, for socks spelled out anywhere, but um, you know it has to be uh, no melt, no drip, and um, you know meet those requirements at a minimum. Um, but we don't specify you know a specific type of sock for sailors to wear. Um, the ones that they that they wear um, do not include any uh, flammable fibers or melting fibers. Thanks. Um, it kind of is a follow up on that, and I think this is one particularly for Scott, and then I will add on to it. Is if the production is uh, outsourced or if a company is making a product and they need to help with outsourcing, can the North Carolina Military Business Center assist with sourcing materials and production facilities? Yeah, thanks, Mary. And uh, <clears throat> thanks to Perry for asking that question. And, and the answer is yes. Uh, and, and it's a little longer than that. So the North Carolina Military Business Center, we've got a quite a large database of businesses in our state, about 30,000 businesses, not all of those are textiles, obviously, but we can certainly help with uh, outsourcing of, uh, of production and supply, uh, certainly across that, utilizing that database. The other thing I would say is here in North Carolina, we have the Textile Technology Center and also the Manufacturing Solutions Center. They're great partners and they have, uh, they have uh, clients, customers, partners uh, nationwide. So uh, we would certainly refer, you know, uh, get additional input from the Manufacturing Solutions Center and Textile Technology Center if we were looking for a production capability uh, for anybody, a designer that uh, that was looking for that capacity. So the short answer is yes, and we will leverage uh, numerous sources to make that happen. And I, I will add to that, that there is an MEP, a Manufacturing Extension Partnership Program in every state, um, and the National MEP Network has a supplier scouting program that is free to companies. Uh, you have to answer specific questions and go through the process, and then they send it out through the national network and the individual state, you know, the expert who's the person who's the expert on the ground in an individual state will uh, suggest that companies uh, res respond, um, and that that is an excellent way to match uh, into suppliers or uh, when you need fibers or materials or something components uh, that you're having trouble sourcing, or maybe it's a sole source and you're looking for secondary um, and backups. So don't hesitate to reach out to your uh, manufacturing extension partnership for that kind of service as well. Uh, let's see here. Um, is there a way to know whether a concept is obsolete before beginning the research? Uh, for example, in protective gear and like Kevlar. And, and I'm sorry, I'm not ever sure which one of you wants to jump in. So. But, um, you know, Chris mentioned earlier about submitting white papers for new ideas, and I think that's a great idea. Um, companies that submit white papers with their idea, um, if it gets circulated to the to the right organization, so if it's textile and clothing related, and comes to NCTRF, um, we can take a look at it and see if it's something that we've already looked at, if something we're interested in. Um, you know, I think that's the best way to uh, approach a concept. Yeah, um, you know, I guess in, in terms of what, being the small business director, what I'm always mindful of is um, how do we limit uh, the upfront uh, resource constraint with, with getting ideas to our customers if, if ultimately that's not what we're looking at. And I think white paper is the, the best thing you're gonna do now. I would, I guess, argue if, if you're within the space, you're probably gonna know 
uh, what's cutting edge and, and maybe what's an old idea. Um, but I also see what what's being put out there from, you know, ONR or NCTRF as far as the trends that, that they're looking at in terms of textiles. Um, but I'm not sure, and, and I'll let NCTRF kind of respond as to whether or not there's, you know, um, like a long range forecast for types of capabilities that you're looking for. Um, I can I can take some. So where we don't have a program office <laughs> that Navy does not for uniforms, that really does hearken to the challenge space with which we operate. So we do we are moving and we are looking to understanding that more of a long range plan and to have a better gauge on how you know where we would like our investment strategy to be. Um, there's forums that we're um, actively, that were previously um, set up and established, but they weren't managed. So we have a uniform summit that we're actively utilizing to look at what the current uniforms are and then kind of seeing where we would want to take in the next, you know, two to three years and, and looking further out. And then also the Navy Protective Clothing Board as well. And that's more in the realm of the general purpose organizational clothing. Um, so that helps to aid us as well in looking at areas where the fleet identifies uh, gaps as well. So a lot of the gaps that the team presented yesterday, a lot of those have come out of those two forums that we've had. And that's with, um, that's with all of the, uh, the entities that, you know, get together and have that discussion and the stakeholders so that we can kind of start that um, dialogue. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's also in regards to when you're looking at obsolete products and talking at a broader all service, the JPBI that DLA hosts, that gives a good understanding of that perspective from uh, a long range as well. Scott. Um, and Lynn, you started to say something. So do you want to add something to that? And then we'll go to Scott and, and back to Chris if he's got more to add. Sure, I was just going to add that I think any concept as far as design concepts, um, I wouldn't really knock out as obsolete ever because just because we looked at something once and it may not have fit the need then, it doesn't mean that, it, you know, now we might not find a need for it. Great, thank you. And Scott, you had something to yeah, add? Yeah, just very briefly from the, on the industry side, we would certainly be, uh, uh, be happy to connect anybody with a question like that with resources like the Wilson College of Textiles at NC State, uh, very much on the forefront of textile technology. So we could bounce any ideas like that uh, on obsolescence off of, uh, off of the Wilson College, be happy to do that. Great, thank you. Um, the next question, um, is the military making any moves toward addition or removal of fluorochemicals, PFAS or PFOA in its uniforms or wearable textiles? If they are looking at non-PFAS alternative technologies, are there restrictions on what type of chemi chemistry could be applied to textiles? The answer is yes, but I don't have the specifics um, available. We work closely with um, FR subject matter experts at the Army. So if that person who submitted that question wants to reach out to me directly, I can provide a more detailed response. Okay, great. That one came through email, so I'll forward it over to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and uh, we just have one more question. Um, the lack of hands-on skill for manufacturing and old school tailoring is problematic and will continue to get worse. Uh, this will not be turned around in a time scale of less than years. Is anyone, as far as you know, examining or working on a strategy for educating and recruiting future experts, craft persons, and technical knowledge? Mary, I can touch on that briefly. And again, <laughs> our, our uh, exposure is mostly here within our state, but AFOA has provided a uh, subcontract grant to our MEP at NC State to develop a workforce development program specifically for textiles and advanced textile technology. So uh, it definitely is a workforce focus. It is a well-recognized issue 
our companies here in our state, I know, are, are uh, experiencing severe uh, workforce shortages, not just from COVID related, but from the degradation of those kinds of skills and people turning away from manufacturing careers. So uh, I know AFOA is very much involved with this, as is our uh, MEP is be doing this uh, regional workforce study and, uh, yeah, and I, program. Sorry, I was going to do a shout out to AFOA. There are a couple of people from AFOA, which is the Advanced Functional Fabrics of America, uh, situated up in, in Massachusetts, uh, that are um, here in the room today, um, and that they are uh, an, an excellent resource and, and starting to work and doing work in workforce development. The Rhode Island Textile Innovation Network is also focused on that. Um, we piloted a, uh, right and piloted a sewing program, which has been expanded through a program called We Make Rhode Island in Rhode Island to train uh, people for the industrial sewing workforce. Um, and uh, I think that the, we see the need. I'm not aware of a, a more national uh, outlook or program that has started um, to help make sure that those skill sets are taught and expanded. Um, if we need to wrap up, uh, the retired Rear Admiral is in the room and um, we would like to move to his talk. So does anyone have any final words uh, that they would like to add um, to questions that were answered before we move on? Um, I do want to add into that last question. I think that area really is something that's overlooked. I have um, been, although I am not a good sewer whatsoever, honestly, I will admit that. I can tell you how to, what stitching you should use, what thread you should use, what needle you should use, what type of stitch you should use, but I by far can accomplish that objective. I leave it to the experts. But I will say that skill set, it, it really is one of those where you start seeing, you know, you go into the carpentry and you go into those areas and it's just a lost art. And those that want to maintain it, it, it just, it, it, the interest is not there. And it, it's, you know, I and, and Rich got off the line, but one area that, you know, brings to light it was they have many tailors that are within the uniform store and one individual you know she's been doing it for you know and this is what you'll find in the tailoring industry is that you have this one entity that's been doing it for 40 plus years and you know they just can't do it anymore and and you don't have any of that knowledge transfer per se and this is a skill it's kind of you know like um soldering and, and there's, I'm sure now Chris can also say as well, like the welding that area where that um, people, individuals, the interest isn't there. They want to be in these whiz bang high tech areas. So I think in the next few years, like Rich said earlier, we lost one of, you know, our major brand Brooks Brothers that was surviving, supplying our premier line. And mm -hmm. it's just, within the United States, it, it really is a challenge area in, in it that I think is really being overlooked. And I hope I'll happily work with entities and academia and also, you, you know, TechBridge and such to, you know, to really stimulate that area. I'm very much interested in, in that area. Over. Yeah, that'll be a good follow-up, I think, for, from this is like a longer conversation about those needs. Yes. All right. Well, I want to thank you all for participating. Um, we are very thankful that you are all here and we appreciate your participation yesterday and today. Um, and we are going to just take a second to switch back into slide. And next up, I would like to introduce retired Rear Admiral Robert J. Bianchi, who is the CEO of Nexcom. He is the uh, in his position, he provides leadership and management oversight of the $3 billion annual worldwide operations of Navy exchanges, Navy Lodge ship store programs, Navy uniform program management offices, Navy clothing and textile research facility, and the telecommunication program office. Bianchi is Nexcom's first civilian chief executive officer. He joins the command after retiring from the U.S. Navy with more than 29 years of service as the Navy Supply Corps officer. While in the Navy, he served in various senior leadership positions, 
including Assistant Deputy Chief of Staff for Fleet Readiness and Fleet Supply Officer, U.S. Fleet Forces Command, Commander Navy Exchange Service Command, Deputy Commander for Aviation, Naval Inventory Control Point, Military Advisor to the Deputy Undersecretary of Defense, Log Logistics and Material Readiness, and Supply Officer, USS Harry S. Truman, CVN 75. A native of Vinland, New Jersey, Bianchi attended the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill on a Navy ROTC scholarship, receiving a Bachelor of Arts degree in mathematics. Upon graduation in 1982, he was commissioned an ensign in the US Navy Supply Corps. He earned a master's degree in business administration with distinction from Harvard University in 1992 and completed the Wharton School of Business Executive Development Program in 2003. Bianchi was awarded the DOD Distinguished Civilian Service Award in November 2019. His military awards include the Defense Superior Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, three awards, the Mater Materius Service Medal, six awards, the Joint Service kind of, uh, Commendation Medal, the Navy and Marine Corps uh, Medal, two awards, and the Navy and Marine Corps Achievement Medal. In addition, Bianchi also serves as a special assistant to ASD, M, and RA for resale transformation. So we're very honored to have you here today, and thank you for uh, giving us a, a sense of the overview of, of the future and, and what is here today. Well, thanks very much, Mary, and uh, good afternoon to all of you. Uh, it's great to be with you today. Uh, and I understand from uh, talking to Laura that you've had a, a great uh, day yesterday and, and lots of uh, wonderful collaboration and, and idea sharing and so forth. And, uh, and so I'm uh, very, very pleased uh, to be able to uh, spend some time with you this this morning. Uh, I want to thank the hosts of this event uh, because without your support, I know we could not have uh, brought this to fruition. And that includes our teammates at Naval X and the 401 Tech Bridge. Uh, your efforts continue to provide opportunities to accelerate the development of advanced materials and technologies. The North Carolina Military Business Center, thank you for providing the Zoom platform and all the support in this critical area. Uh, you know, this workshop has certainly brought together some great minds to investigate, develop, and identify new and emerging technologies and concepts focused on improving or innovating military gear, clothing, design elements, and textiles. Before coming on board as Nexcom's first civilian CEO, uh, as Mary mentioned, I am a retired rear admiral. I wore the cloth of our nation for nearly 30 years as the Navy Supply Corps officer and retired uh, a few years ago. So I do fully understand the importance of a safe, comfortable, and functional uniform. As some of you may know, the Navy Supply Corps, which I was a part of within the Navy, has a slogan, and we say that we're ready for sea. And while that's generally interpreted as being always prepared for any mission at the tactical level, it also extends all the way back to the support structure that delivers the tactical capabilities, the critical R&D, and the swift procurement of the best and most capable weapon systems, ordnance, parts upgrades or combat platform development. And the Navy's acquisition professionals to include the Navy Supply Corps officers and civilians spend much time and effort closely working with industry to field state-of-the-art defense capabilities. And the same is true for our uniforms and protective clothing items. In my almost 30 years of service, I saw countless uniform changes. As research boomed and the requirements of naval operations changed, so did the needs for our uniforms and protective gear. World War II to Operation Enduring Freedom, to the current Operation Allies Refuge, and everything in between. Our men and women on the ground, above or below the ocean and in the sky, came to be viewed essentially as individual weapon systems. Ultimately, one can say that the readiness of our Navy warfighters intrinsically starts with the uniform that's on their back, 
and the gear that they carry. And it is the work that is being accomplished by this group, all of you right here today, that ensures that our US military never enters a fair fight. We always want the tactical advantage. We are truly the world's best naval fighting force because of the contributions of you and your colleagues. And as I stated earlier, I've seen firsthand the evolution of so many uniforms from chambray shirts and dungarees to wash khakis to improved flame resistant variant coveralls and the like. And soon we'll be fielding not only the Navy's two piece fire resistant uniform to the fleet, but also a new iBoot 5 and steam suits for submariners, both of which were developed in close collaboration with industry. There's also much ongoing research and development being accomplished in areas of seamless knitting, cold weather gear experimentation, and the NWU type three design refinement, just to name a few. But make no mistake, all of the advancements in uniforms and protective gear has at its foundation a strong partnership with industry, in particular, the clothing and textile industrial base. None of the critical initiatives that I've mentioned earlier could have been accomplished without this close relationship. You know, quite often I hear from Navy officials or members of Congress who are somewhat disillusioned by the amount of time and effort that is needed to develop a new uniform or clothing item to meet the requirements of our warfighters. As you all understand, but many of them do not, it's not just a matter of producing any run-of-the-mill khaki shirt that they can get from a Target or Walmart. That uniform shirt takes into account specific types of fibers, specifics on shade, the type of environment where it's gonna be worn, the type of activity for its use, the durability and so forth. And while we all hope for faster, cheaper, better, there is a process intentionally put in place to ensure a quality product is ultimately delivered to the US Navy. And so it is my responsibility many times to explain to our uniformed leaders and those in Congress, the steps necessary to develop and field a military garment. In fact, I regularly compare it to the development of any other weapon system, like a missile or even a new submarine. It follows the same established process for all of the same important reasons. But just like with other weapon systems, during the various stages of research, development, acquisition, and fielding, there are oftentimes requests for adjustments or changes from Congress or senior leaders. Researching or satisfying these requests takes time, costs money, and requires transparent communications with industry partners. I like to think Nextcom's commitment to establishing and maintaining close relationships with industry leaders can help mitigate some of these types of perturbations in our clothing and textile programs that are inevitable. And forums like this one can help accelerate this relationship building. You know, there are a number of recent examples of where military industry relationships were really critical to success. One such example is the introduction of a government issued running shoe for all the recruits at boot camp that was mandated as part of the FY17 NDAA. Our role at NEXCOM was to manage the program efforts across the entire Navy to ensure successful execution and implementation. Now, this effort required not only a high level of dialogue between our sister services, industry, DLA, OPNAV, and the recruit commands, but also an awareness of the many technical requirements aligned to the actual fabrication of the running shoe. And then the important feedback loop once the shoe, the shoe was fielded. Without this extensive amount of collaboration throughout the acquisition life cycle, I'm convinced this program would have never been delivered to Navy. More recently, sailors attached to the Virginia class submarine, the USS Vermont, conducted a wear test and training for a newly designed steam suit. The initiative to improve the legacy steam suit originated directly from a sailor in the fleet who submitted his idea to Office of Naval Research's Tech Solutions program. Tech Solutions provided funding, which was executed by our NCTRF team, along with industry partners, all with the common goal of providing better protection for sailors in the event of a rupture in the pressurized steam lines aboard a submarine. 
Such ruptures can leak steam at extremely high temperatures, potentially resulting in severe injury or death. This newly designed suit is currently on six Virginia class submarines, and in the next two, two to three years will be incorporated into all Virginia and upcoming Columbia class submarines as well. And finally, NEXTCOM's NCTRF team successfully led an effort in conjunction with our Navy's Uniform Matters Office and Naval Air Systems Command to improve the Navy's steel-toed boot, culminating in the launch of what we now call the iBoot 5. Over the years, UMO received many sailor complaints with our legacy boot, citing comfort issues, foreign object debris or FOD performance and traction issues aboard ship. So partnering with various industry representatives for the latest technology in sole and upper designs, Navy was able to field an integrated boot design that can be used in a variety of Navy environments while providing comfort for all day wear by sailors deployed on a carrier or working the flight line. We will now have one multi-purpose boot that replaces several current specific purpose boots saving inventory investment and operating dollars. You know, while I can cite many successes like this, I fully realize there remain many challenges to maintaining a vibrant clothing and textile industrial base. I believe we're all well aware of the Berry Amendment, which has been in place since 1941 and restricts DOD from using appropriated funds for procurement of clothing, fabrics, fibers, yarns, or other made up textiles that are not grown reprocessed, reused, or produced in the United States. Because of this statute, the viability of the textile and clothing production base in the U.S. is an absolute imperative. As such, we in the DOD must continually do our part in creating opportunities that support both the large and small businesses that make up this critical component of our readiness equation. Please know that I remain dedicated to fostering innovation and development of new technologies while ensuring our Navy and congressional leadership understand the importance of the textile industrial base to our Defense Department and specifically to the needs of our Navy and our sailors. And I believe it's events like this collaborative workshop which serve an important role in highlighting the importance of building the military and industry partnership. I'm optimistic about the future of clothing and textiles and the role each of you will play in it, whether you represent research, design, testing, commercial manufacturing, or academia. Because one thing I know for certain is that we in the military can't succeed without your help. So in closing, I do thank you so much for having me here today. I look forward to the continued dialogue and collaboration that will follow from this workshop. And as I say to my team all the time, keep charging out there and thank you for your support. Thanks. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, seriously, thank you very much. Uh, uh, it was a great uh, opportunity and an honor to, to be with all of you today. And I really do hope uh, you're able to take away a lot of goodness from this. Uh, we're very excited to work with our, our partners within Navy there and Naval X and, and innovation uh, in general. Uh, we will uh, continue to support our clothing and textile uh, industrial base here as uh, they provide all of these uh, very critical uh, supplies and services to us. So good luck with the remainder of the event here and thank you all for uh, your time today and hopefully uh, uh, my comments uh, were uh, insightful and will help uh, further the, the discussion, but you know that you've got a supporter uh, in me. So thanks very much. Thank you. And you've got a large audience here from North Carolina who are saying no tar go Tar Heels. In the ah, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> the industrial base is very supportive uh, to make sure the warfighter has the, the materials that they need. Thank you so much, sir. Awesome. Take care. Everybody stay healthy out there. Thank you. Um, that is the close of the, um, the presentation today. We'd like to thank 401 TechBridge, the North Carolina Military Business Center, NAVSOP, the Naval Clothing and Textile Research Facility, um, and our, uh, the Rhode Island Textile Innovation Network. 
the North Carolina Military Business Service. We uh, appreciate all your support and thank you for helping us put this, put this program together. Uh, Laura, do you have any closing words to add? Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you, Mary. Um, yes, this was NCTRF and our first go working with the um, Naval X and the 401 Tech Bridge and North Carolina uh, Military Business Center and um, in a webinar. So we've been working with them, but in a webinar setup. And it, I appreciate everyone, all the attendees and um, it, it was a great experience and, and hopefully um, those that participated took away, like we said, a little snippet of information that you didn't have prior to the event. Um, and we look forward to collaborating and having further dialogue. Please feel free to reach out to individuals that are within um, their comms are provided. And if not, um, if you just have a little question in regards to, you can NCTRF or, or such, feel free to reach out to me directly and I can help to facilitate answers to those questions. So um, again, thank you to the Northeast Naval X in support of the, the event. Again, the 401 Tech Bridge um, fielding all my annoying questions and, hey, can you do this? Or do you mind it? Can we do that? Or how are we going to do this? Or how are we going to do that? Um, the North Carolina Military Business Center for setting up this Zoom platform in, in, in helping to facilitate and also participation as well. Um, the Rhode Island Textile Innovation Network. Um, thank you for getting the word out. And also thank you to my team for putting together a very comprehensive understanding of NCTRF and a great demonstration of our capabilities in, in, in execution of the mission. So thanks to all. This was a great event and um, hopefully this won't be the last. Thank you, Mary. Thank you. thank you so much for coming today. We appreciate your time. Over the last couple of days, there's been a ton of information. Um, the program was recorded and we will send out links to the recording uh, after the program so that you can um, catch up on pieces you might have missed or follow up on individual contact information that was included in the slides. Thanks so much. And we will close now.